There are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. But there are also unknown knowns. The Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope is a secret society devoted to unearthing and sharing this forgotten knowledge. Each episode, we take one of these strange stories and share it with you. No topic is off limits, except for the obvious. Hey there, Anishi. It's a bit disorganized this week. Where's that? There's got to be another tape in this bag. Ah, here we go. When you walk through an art museum, what happens? You see some interesting things. You see some not so interesting things. <laughs> and if you're like me at all, you, you're probably a little bit sleepy. Well, grab a cafecito and listen up. It's Art Slice, a palatable serving of art history. I'm Russell Shoemaker. I'm Stephanie Duenas. We are not your daddy's art history podcast. <laughs> we are both artists, so we look at art history through that perspective. We cover the artists you know and those that have been ignored for so many different reasons. We look at the context of the time. We compare it to today. We don't dumb anything down, but, and this is a big but, hey, we like to have a good time, okay? Nos gusta to goof <laughs> around, all right? We have hungry pantry no, mons that no, might startle you. It's a long story. We, we feed them our materials. Art is just a visual language, so in order for us to interpret what we think it's saying, we hijack the work. Right. How do you like that for an art heist? Exactly. And ultimately, we decide if it belongs in our Art Slice Museum, okay. on top of the Art Slice okay. top. So, so if this all sounds right. good to you, join us on Art Slice a palatable serving of art history. It's a really good show. You should listen to it. I should do more episodes about art. We're doing something a little bit different this episode. This is an interview I did with Michael Finney of the Chicago 1893 Project, which is devoted to documenting the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and Columbian Exposition. I hope you like it. The White City, presented by number 1893. We're here today with uh, Michael Finney of the Chicago 1893 Project. Michael, thank you for being with us here today. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's just start off with the idiot question. What is the Chicago 1893 World's Fair and Columbian Exposition? Back in uh, the 1890s, right, they were trying to find a site within the Americas to hold a World's Fair after a lot of contentious jockeying for place uh, between a handful of cities around the country, uh, Chicago was selected, and the event occurred on the south side of the city in what is known as Jackson Park, what was then you know pretty swampy land. They had to do a little bit of terraforming and, and build up a 600-acre parcel into... Uh, basically a city within the city. It was an opportunity for people from around the world to come to America, specifically Chicago, and feature their culture and their uh, technological advancements. And, um, you know, a lot of people found their way to the city for one reason or another. And, um, you know, a few things still exist. and. It, it did have a, a huge impact, you know, not only on Chicago specifically, like the legacy of Chicago's, uh, you know, not tightly wound to that event, but it certainly was like the turning point after the Chicago fire of 1871, where um, the city basically was able to represent itself and say, you know, we're back uh, and we're better than ever. So what first drew you to the Chicago World's Fair as a subject? I grew up around Chicago, you know, and like as you're making your way around the city and through the city, it has like this lasting kind of mimetic presence because there are a few buildings still there. There are artworks there. There are things that you run across in different places where you'll hear the event get mentioned or like the people want to say like, oh, this was from that or this goes back to that time. As a kid, it was, you know, growing up in the 90s and stuff, it was like, oh, that was 100 years ago. It seems like forever. And then you get older and you're like, eh, it wasn't actually that long ago, you know? <laughs> and um, more and more things start to kind of pop out at you. 
that are interesting or relevant, you know, to the world that we live in today. And over the course of my life, there were just a number of interesting things that had occurred, you know, and eventually I really just couldn't deny being associated or affiliated or connected to the event anymore. I had gone to Spain with family when I was a kid, and there was supposed to be another World's Fair in Chicago, another exposition like that in 19... 19- 93 but it it failed to get off the ground but the sister site was held in spain i went there as a kid with my family at the time wasn't drawing the connection to it being this other side of what was an event that didn't occur in chicago you know having having grown up there and stuff you know I was a musician in a past life and um i ended up trying out for a band i sent them a scratch track for vocals to a song and and they were going by the name Colombian Exposition at the time. At the time, you know, it was just like, oh, that's interesting that, you know, quirky name ties to the city. We're all from around here. Uh, you know, and I didn't really think too much about that at the time. Whenever that is happening to me, whenever I start to have these synchronicities emerging, I like to try and follow up with it and like um, steer into that as much as possible more and more things started to kind of stack up. And then after I started the project, like then it really just kind of like flooded out, like how much stuff was around. And I just started seeing the year and running across lucky circumstances, you know, that like put me near things at a, at a just a great time to be able to learn more and collect images and, um, you know, talk with people and be able to, synthesize that into some form of understanding and then turn that into uh, the book and documentary that are out on Amazon. So what does the Chicago 1893 project uh, do? So what it does is really tries to keep the legacy of the event alive. The kind of thesis of the, the book and the documentary is that the Columbian Exposition was the doorstep, you know, to the 20th century in regards to arts and culture. And, you know, I do believe that it, it really did kind of like open everything up. So they've got 600 acres worth of swamp land to clear out and build a giant uh, exposition space. I'm sure that went about as smoothly as any civic construction project ever goes. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's fair to argue that it went. Uh, more smoothly, really, really like, uh, you know, they did all this in like 18 months, you know, building this site out, not only the buildings, but uh, converting the grounds. So if you're familiar with Olmsted, the landscape designer, he's a legend, uh, you know, Central Park being probably the crown jewel of his career, he was tasked with getting the actual gardens and walkways into shape uh with <laughs> within those 18 months so like trees don't grow in 18 months you know what i mean and the other side of it is he also had to work around massive buildings getting <laughs> constructed and was able to do that and uh they got all the buildings together um they did actually delay because there was so much back and forth political kind of jockeying to to secure the event and then also uh, you know, within Chicago in regards to like, where is this thing going to go? They ended up pushing it back. So it was supposed to be a 400th anniversary of Columbus coming to America, but that would mean that it would have been in 1892 and it wasn't, it was in 1893. So they did actually kind of give themselves an extra year there. It seems absolutely amazing that given all of the delays and problems that they had, that they only missed the original dedication date uh, by a week. They basically, what, were a week after Columbus Day, 1892, when they had the dedication right. ceremony. Right, right. And like when you see the pictures of that period of time, um, when they were kind of like doing that initial kind of opening of the grounds and, and dedication and everything, like there's still... Um, like scaffolding and uh everything's not it's not totally all buttoned up today we would just leave all those exposed structural elements out there and call it a day but back then they had to cover them all up yeah right so i suppose to help getting everything up on time that most of these buildings were meant to be strictly temporary i think that um there is that element to it but then also in general 
like the biggest buildings were really these presentation spaces where a lot of other nations and companies were responsible for filling them. Uh, the, the main architects, you know, that, that Burnham, uh, selected as director of works and, and set to designing and, uh, producing these buildings on the grounds, like they weren't focused too much on, on the interiors of those major structures. Now, a lot of the other buildings, they were like, uh, the national buildings, you know, they were a lot smaller, obviously. So that, you know, changes things by a number of factors, but they were also like really ornate, not only, uh, uniquely designed on the exterior, but uniquely decorated on their interiors. And, um, you know, there's just a lot, a lot of really beautiful, great stuff all over, all over the, the site. You know, when you're looking around, like, I've, I've looked at a, quite a lot of pictures over the years. And when you see inside of these places and just like how lavish some of them are in general, you know, that is pretty incredible. It really is astounding how much public sculpture there was per square foot of the exhibition. It really it must have been quite a feast for the census. Uh, there are a lot of incredible artists that at that point in time participated at the event and obviously being able to manufacture huge works that rapidly, even for them was tough. You know, you have the McMoney's fountain, uh, you've got the obelisk, you've got the statue of the Republic. You've got just artwork seemingly every probably 50 feet or something, 75 feet on the grounds. Like there's something to look at, particularly around the grand base that to me is like one of the kind of defining pieces of this um aesthetic you know that inhabited that space at the time it's just that like your eyes always have something to take in and to observe and to be informed about in regards to beauty and information right they really strive to give people something to feast their eyes on it's 1893 the world's fair finally opens uh i'm assuming it was a big hit yeah uh you know it is <laughs> a major attraction it basically um helped chicago kind of weather what was happening economically in general there was kind of a little bit of a, a downturn for a number of years so they they were kind of in a recession and chicago was able to actually get through that period of time better because of how much money and work was occurring, uh, how much money was coming into the community as a result of the work that needed to occur there. At any given point, I think like 30,000 people like working on the grounds to get this thing going, you know, and launched. So they are going to want to be paid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're also going to be spending that money and, uh, you know, they couldn't go very far. They were going to be spending that into the Chicago ecosystem. So the fair opens, you know, lots of well-known, renowned and famous people come on out to it. There are a number of people, um, you know, that we know who kind of point at that event uh, as kind of highly influential for them or their family. Like Disney, his father uh, supposedly was a worker there. And, you know, that it sort of attained legendary status for him, perhaps always keeping the idea of something like that in his mind leading up to, say, like Disney World or whatever. Frank Baum, the uh, writer of The Wizard of Oz, kind of drew inspiration from the White City as influence for Oz and the Emerald City. And that is, I just think that's fantastic. That to me is just such a uh, an incredible thing because that, let's say, brand or that particular story, that world, is is still uh, fantastic to this day. And I mean, fantastic in the sense that, like, it is it's it's inspiring fantasy, and like that is perhaps something that's in too short of supply. All right. So what sort of things could people see and do at the World's Fair when they finally get in? Uh, the one really awesome thing that like when I first started going through these pictures and seeing that there was like a hot air balloon there, I, I love that. <laughs> uh, 
uh, unfortunately, like a storm kind of wrecked it, so it didn't survive the entire event. But it did, you know, it was their, you know, tor- um, first half or the first side of things. Uh, that to me, like, I just love the idea of like flight and airships and stuff like that in in the late 19th century. Um, I'm in the middle of the book Against the Day right now by Thomas Pynchon. And uh, the chums of chance travel around the world in an airship and their story starts at the Columbian Exposition. And just the idea of like people, they're not like Pinkertons. They're more like a government agency that is just like (laughs) X-File-ish, I suppose. And the idea of like them coming to the event in a airship, like it's just fantastic. I love it. <laughs> we still eat foods and uh, use products and developments that were debuted at that event. Um, you know, there's a, a couple of you know well-known food brands still to this day. You know, like shredded wheat. Um, we've got juicy fruit by Wrigley's then uh you know you've got Vienna beef hot dogs which are you know a, a classic in in the Chicagoland area and then Paps Blue Ribbon likes to or at least um you know the legend goes that they won a blue ribbon at the event and whether that is true or not you know doesn't much matter so much as the fact that you know they claim that you know that was the birth of their brand and and that's fantastic sounds like a like a high school jock still hanging onto his football trophies even though he hasn't done anything in the last 130 years (laughs) brutal wasn't there a pavilion where people could just go to gawk at pretty girls from all 50 states (laughs) women were on display in some capacity and and men were and minorities and like uh you know there's lots to to say in regards to like, well, you know, is this exploitative? Uh, and you know, yeah, it probably is. Um, then again, like what were these people doing before? Were they doing the same things? Were they doing those things? And were they, you know, did they relocate to this event to do those same things? Well, I'm sure some of them did. (laughs) So like, you know, it's a case by case basis, I suppose. And we can't go back and ask them. And, and give us like a candid perspective on it. We have to do the best that we can and just say that like this stuff did occur. And um, how can we produce events or include people in a, in a higher integrity fashion you know, now? I find it interesting that the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis gets a mm. lot of uh, flack for its treatment of ethnic minorities or people from other countries and cultures, whereas the 1893 exhibition gets a little ignored, though I think it may be helped that in 1904, they literally put them in a zoo. Right. That's certainly like contextualized things in a certain way, I would say. Whereas I think that like in Chicago, there was definitely an effort to create these experiences and to have people inhabiting this space to make it feel populated, properly populated, you know, with the people that projectively uh, existed there or participated in that culture, uh, you know, obviously, like, again, is all of that above board? Is all of that 100% authentic? Well, no, you know, of course not, because it's a recreation and it's in Chicago. <laughs> like, right. So, I mean, you kind of have to just say, like, we're going to suspend disbelief. And also, you know, for people of 2022 to, like, go back and sit and, like, browbeat stuff that is over and done and gone in 1893, I mean, you're beating a dead horse. It's just, it's really going to be tough to make any change about that, you know? Again, I think it's just the say, okay, well, we understand these things and we're going to move forward trying to to be and do better than some of those instances. What happened to all these temporary buildings after the fair ended? (laughs) The two structures that obviously are still in existence would be the Art Institute. Uh, You know, obviously that one was meant to be permanent. And then the Art Palace, what is now known as the Museum of Science and Industry, had to be more permanent because 
the other countries that were shipping over their artworks for display would not allow them to be put into a temporary building that had a higher risk of fire, particularly in the shadow of uh, 1871 and Chicago's sort of uh, legendary status in regards to (laughs) so much of the city burning down just over 20 years earlier. So that building was obviously um, designed and built at higher standards than uh, the other ones. Maybe like half a dozen buildings that kind of still exist in different places. Like I think the main state building exists in like, there's like some spring water area up in Maine. One of the ticket booths from the event is in Oak Park, uh, Illinois, which is also architecturally kind of a mecca because there are a bunch of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings there. And so his connection, you know, to kind of spin this back around is that Frank Lloyd Wright studied with Louis Sullivan, who was responsible for designing the transportation building at the 1893 World's Fair. So why do you think this World's Fair is the one people remember? It wasn't the first World's Fair the United States had ever had, and it certainly wasn't the last. No one remembers the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. Uh, If they remember the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, it's probably because they saw Meet Me in St. Louis. Uh, and if they remember the Knoxville World's Fair, it's from a joke in The Simpsons. Uh, why is this one that's the one that sticks in people's heads? I think, you know, it's just the right time for America. The United States was not a world and global player, you know, uh, through the 1900s. All of a sudden, you know, the country had finally kind of stretched across the continent we were filling in some gaps and and creating states out of territories and um you know it had kind of established itself as a nearly complete thing right or it it seemed to be complete and it was easy to project wonder and um hope onto america it's just this really magnificent polished experience that was very rapidly created and allowed people to live in a fantasy. You know, obviously we, we want those things. Uh, we, we must, which is why we like video games and movies and theme parks and all these other things. And like for the, for the people of that era and that time, like it did all of those things. They, promoted this event by sending out photos of this stuff just imagine seeing you know pictures of this of this location it was impossible to be jaded out the way that we are about like um you know the magic kingdom of of disney world or something like disney world just seems like such a given like it, it has such object permanence but in 1893 the idea of there being like this white city that's like inside of another city. That's just incredible, you know? Um, And I think that it was really the, the first time that something at that scale had been experienced by so many people, over 25 million people went to this thing. I mean, I, I imagine that it would have been tough to exist in 1893 or 1894 without this being a conversation piece just general, generally you know um in most communities around, around America because so many people had gone to it or had participated in some aspect of it uh there were people from all over the country and the world coming here to work for the you know 18 months prior to the event in addition to the run of the event like every state was at this thing, you know what I mean? So people from every state were coming here. They were building their, their structures. They were illustrating their industry and their commerce and bringing all these just like really, um, unique things that were geographically relevant, you know, to, to them, to Chicago for people to, to witness. And like it, I just feel like, you know, that that's probably why, uh, this particular event stands out. It I haven't seen any of the other ones, you know, achieve the level of grandeur that this thing did. 
Um, you know, is the Ferris wheel better than the Eiffel Tower? Well, you know, I don't know, but a lot of cities have Ferris wheels and, you know, only a couple of cities have Eiffel Towers. So, <laughs> uh, we don't necessarily go to this summer fair, your state fair or, or, you know, theme parks and amusement parks and say, I want to ride an elevator to the top of their Eiffel Tower, you know? You say that, but I've been to the top of the Eiffel Tower at Kings Dominion in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not saying don't. I'm just yeah. saying, like, you know, that's not necessarily um, a strong meme inside of the uh, amusement and theme park industry. As a kid, I think most people have, like, uh, you know, that first experience with a Ferris wheel and, and riding one and like being that far up and looking at the world when it, there are lots of very tall buildings and you can do that, but it, it is different than a Ferris wheel. I think people don't really grasp the scale of the one that was constructed for the World's Fair because that was sure. huge. Right. And it was the first one. Right. Uh, so people had not ever had that experience. And that was like, remarkable for them and they and the cars were huge i think they put like 60 people in one of the cars i mean just um, imagine being in a ferris wheel with 59 other people what was the whole trip it was like 30 minutes or something you were really going for a ride you know uh not just like two turns on the ferris wheel and you're done you know what i mean like and you know it's a great view aerial views are uh short supply at that point in time now, I think I saw this on your Twitter that you're working on a uh, uh, augmented reality version of the World's Fair. Yeah, yeah. So for the last year, I've been doing, you know, this next phase of things, which is basically a wealth of research into the design schematics and elevation drawings. I've been chasing this stuff down across the Internet and in the museums and facilities around the city when I have the time and the opportunity. And what we've been doing is recreating the buildings around the Grand Basin right now. So not the entire grounds, but at least the main major structures around what was known as the Grand Basin. So there are a lot of buildings there that are very large. And basically we've got uh, most of them done now at a one-to-one -one scale. And, um, you know, very soon, Actually, so we're recording this in, in April, and I know that it's not going to be released until May, but just in general, uh, before the end of this month, which is April, I'm going to release the first look at one of the buildings to kind of show publicly. And then uh, next month, I will release a uh, kind of promo video for the project in general that'll kind of talk about the uh, trajectory of, of what it is about, which is to bring these buildings back to life so people can experience them at, at the size that they were. Because to me, you know, well, you know, we're not going to rebuild this thing, but to me, I think that it's a real shame that these were temporary structures, but at the same time, being able to, uh, reproduce them digitally means that we can maybe roll back some of the ephemerality. Of, of that event and well the outcome of the event which was to say that most of these buildings actually burned down after uh after the event closed so they did exist on the south side for a number of years and then uh unfortunately it kind of fell into disrepair people weren't um maintaining things and there were different things going on down there and eventually you know a, a couple of fires really kind of trashed out the site um so, you know, none of that exists anymore. Um, and the thinking is that like, you know, that's, that's a real shame. And, uh, I think that when we look at modern architecture, you know, it doesn't necessarily convey the same meanings or aesthetics or human sort of touch that some of these older structures did just because they are more tied into symbolism and the mathematics of balance really you know and that's something that uh you know i feel is, is generally lacking when i see some things now that's not to say that like all modern architecture is bad it, it certainly isn't there's some fantastic stuff happening with materials 
and design. Um, but then again, you know, there are some eyesores out there and uh, the ability to spin up these buildings digitally inside of your phone or through uh, augmented reality lenses at least gives you the opportunity to perceive the scale and um, and get a look at what what they were like because you know there are many pictures uh, but it's not the same uh, looking at a picture depending on no matter how big it is you know compared to being able to walk along the side of a building that if it was 700 feet long like you can you can walk along the, the, those 700 feet. Uh, you know, in reality, if you wanted to. Now, these things can be scaled uh, to any size, really. But the majesty of it, for me, when I'm kind of working with the prototypes and stuff that we have now, is that you're able to really perceive that scale and that you're able to get up close and, and like, look up at these things and just get a uh, a feeling about being in their presence that, people haven't had for like you're saying uh, almost 130 years is there any chance of just getting a straight up virtual reality version for those of us who aren't getting to chicago anytime soon so you will not have to come to chicago to experience this uh it will be anywhere in the world so that'll be very cool you will not have to be bound by the city to be able to experience this thing you know that is important to me as far as a virtual reality experience, um, you know, I'd love to um, do something like that. That requires a lot more heavy lifting. In that sense, you know, do I want to do it? Absolutely. Um, am I going to be able to get that done soon? Uh, I don't know if that's in the cards for this year. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to, to mention or raise? We never really got into like what I would consider to be one of the most kind of esoteric pieces of World's Fair lore. And this is like obviously not um, like mainstream kind of thinking, but there's like some people that believe uh, that the World's Fair sites are like kind of these pre existing locations from like an ancient empire and uh that there was like uh like a mud flood and stuff like that you know have you looked at any of this stuff no this is largely news to me this uh, sounds this is, insane it's hilarious because it's so evidently not true like there are little components of truth within this idea but like on the surface like the actual idea is you know not not true so the empire is called like they call it to our Tartaria or something like like that, and uh, it's the idea that there was like an empire that stretched across North America, and these sites were like their cities, you know, that were there before, and that like they were uncovered and then used for these events as an excuse to then destroy these sites after the events, and it's just like that is such. Uh, such knotted thinking, but I love it. That has to be some real uh, tough work to somehow believe there were these giant neoclassical cities spread all across North America, and that somehow every reference that the Native Americans, that the French, that the English, <laughs> the Spanish just completely edited those all out of our history books and just covered that up. And that no one who was living in Chicago for 200 years thought to mention the giant city on the shores of Lake Michigan that no one lived at. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. I, you know, I love conspiracy. I love that kind of like weird sort of lines of thinking. I always think, you know, why not absorb that stuff and just kind of see what these people had to say? It's just a fantastic bit of modern lore that is being actively constructed like there are some people that will occasionally engage with some of my accounts about the project and like bring this stuff up or like post um like these pictures and, and stuff like that and it's like fantastic like please always do that i love looking at this stuff um, and i love listening to these just like nutty ideas i've been thinking like well what if i had um, the chums of chance, their airship, the inconvenience from against the day, like 
floating in the sky over the Grand Basin like that to me is just fantastic. It, it, it ties right in. It's another piece of alternative history and that, uh, you know, again, like that might be, that might be like where we need to manufacture wonder in 2022 and <laughs> these digital layers of content existing over the real world. You know, I like that idea that, you know, if you just happen to be looking at the app on April fool's day, all of a sudden it's a very different space. <laughs> right. 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 So if people are looking for more information about the Chicago 1893 project or the world's fair in general, uh, where can they find you on the internet? Yeah, so you can find me and connect with uh, the any number of my projects via my website, which is michael-benny.com. And then, uh, you know, it'll direct you to the social media presence. So the Chicago 1893 project exists on Instagram, it has a Facebook page, and most uh, predominantly on Twitter. Michael, thank you for talking with us today. Hey, uh, you know, thanks for having me, David. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to to talk with me this afternoon. And I can't wait to hear what you do with it and to help uh, promote it when it's released. And that's all for this week, Initiates. Until next time, Quiquid Minime Skiant, Optime Skiri. This episode was written and produced by Michael Finney and David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope, and that's not canon productions. Our theme song is Drama D by Scott Roosh. This episode is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All rights reserved, all wrongs reversed. The full script and sources for this episode can be found at orderthejackalope.com. That's orderthejackalope.com with hyphens between the words. Do you have thoughts about this episode? Why not share them on our Discord server? There's a link in the show notes. Or message us on social media. We can be found at Order Jackalope. If social media isn't your thing, send us an email at jackalope at orderthejackalope.com. We're recruiting new Lodge members. We'll initiate anyone into the secret mysteries. All they have to do is share a secret mystery of their own. Visit our website and click join us for more information.